We started a brand new series last weekend. I want to continue what we started last time in a brand new series simply titled, A New Chapter, A New Year. There's more to your story. And I want to begin this weekend by asking you just, just a quick question. How many of you have at least one regret from 2022 or maybe one regret from the first two weeks of 2023? Just raise your hand. Just raise for just a moment. Okay, good. First of all, good for being honest and raising your hand because people beside you didn't, so good for you. But here's the second reason I say good if you raised your hand. I say good because... Having some regrets is a sign of mental health. All right, I'll try this again. How many of you have some regrets? <laughs> yeah, yeah, more of you are going to raise your hand this time. In fact, Karen Schultz, in her TED Talk, and if you've ever listened or watched TED Talks, it can be incredibly interesting. She did a TED Talk on regret, and she said the following. The inability to experience regret is actually one of the diagnostic characteristics of sociopaths. It is also, by the way, characteristic of certain kinds of brain damage. People who have damage to their orbital frontal cortex seem to be unable to feel regret even in the face of even obviously poor decisions. So if you want to live a life free of regret, there is an option for you. It's called a lobotomy. A better option is to think differently about your regrets. Regret, regrets don't just remind us that we did badly. Regrets remind us that we know we can do better. And you can do better. And so can I. You can do better and I can do better because there's more to our story in God. Listen, regrets are a chapter in our life. And let's get real. For some of us, they are many chapters in our life. But they're not our whole story. A chapter is not the whole book. A chapter is not your whole story unless you and I allow it to be. The gist of this new series is there are chapters we experience, but we don't have to let that chapter define the rest of our life or be our life because there's more that God has for us. There's more to our story than any of us have ever experienced. Regret chapters, if they're handled in the best ways, if they're handled in God's ways that we're going to talk about for the next few moments, can actually energize us for the pursuits of newer chapters and a bigger, better life. And that is what God has for us. Those aren't just my words to you. Those aren't my promises to you. They're God's words and promises. Paul writes them in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. He writes, Now glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. That's God's word. That you've not begun to dream what God's dreamed for you. You've not begun to hope what God has hoped for you. You've not begun to imagine what God's imagined for you. So when I tell you there's more to your story, there is. There's more to any, whether you've had good chapters, bad chapters, we've all had them all. There are more chapters for us. In fact, there's a song we used to sing, and one of the things at Benita Valley, we've done a lot of songs through the years. One of them, the, the English wasn't great, but the message was. And the message is, you ain't seen nothing yet. Now, my dad was like an English minor, and he hated when I said ain't, but I, I would say it just to help his blood pressure. Um, but you ain't seen nothing yet when it comes to the story God has for your life. You really haven't. And far too many people allow chapters to be their whole story when it's never meant to be our whole story. Now, last weekend as we started this series, we, we began by talking about one of the ways we get ready for the new is we got to make room for it. The old saying, out with the old, in with the new. And so I gave you three ways that you and I make room for new chapters in our life. And if you were here, I'm going to review it. And if you weren't here, it'll kind of get you up to speed. And, and all the messages are always, always online. But the three ways that we make room for new things is first by forgetting the old ones. God says, forget the former things. Do not dwell or live in the past. To forget doesn't mean we can't recall it. It just means we're not to live in it. We're to learn from it, but we're to leave it, because you can't go forward looking back. You've got to leave it to move forward. So that's what forgetting means. We've got to lose some weights. Now, I didn't say weights. I didn't say pounds. Uh, that can be the case, but that's not 
The writer of the Hebrews says, laying aside, tossing off every weight that hinders us. He wasn't referring to sin because then he specifically mentions sin. He was talking about the secondary things that weigh us down. They're not bad things, but as we talked last week, good things that keep us from the best things can become bad things in our life if they weigh us down. And sometimes you and I are so caught up with secondary things, we miss the most important things. And so we have to lay aside weights. Anyone who is a great success in any endeavor said no to some things to be able to say yes to the better things. They said no even to good things to say yes to the best things. And so good things can become weights. And sometimes we have to lay things aside to go for the life that God has for us. And then thirdly, seizing moments. Seizing moments is about using our clock time to buy moments. The two Greek words for time, one means chronos, clock time, calendar time. The other means events or opportunities. And when Paul says buy up every moment or seize every moment, he's saying use your clock time to buy the moments that make your life. Hours don't make your life. Events make your life. The moments you buy with your time, those moments make your life. So that's how we talked about making room for the new, the new chapters, the new and the bigger, better story God has for us. This weekend, we're going to continue by talking about living beyond our regrets. Regrets can sideline us. They can sideline our hopes. They can sideline our dreams. Now, I'm not talking about minor regrets. Now, regrets come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. We're going to talk about some of those in a couple of moments. I'm not talking about minor regrets. I'm not talking about... Restaurant regrets. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and, and you're at a table, family, friends, and, and the, the table is served and all of a sudden you wish you had ordered that? Why didn't I? Have you ever had restaurant envy? I wish I'd had that. Our dessert comes. Come on, have you ever been at Cheesecake Factory? Is dessert, and you follow the dessert person because you're like, I wish I had ordered that. Now that's restaurant regret and that's easily fixed. Next time, order it. Or if you're sitting beside a spouse or friend who ordered what looks so good to you, just help them. Eat it. Let them regret sitting by you. Just eat. Help, help yourself. Share the regret. Share the food. Okay, I'm not talking about those kind of minor regrets. Oops, I missed that. I missed that. No, no. No, I'm, I'm talking about the kind of regrets that are life crippling. I'm talking about the kind of regrets that are life crushing. I'm talking about the kind of regrets that we think, I will never, I'll never get past this. And if the truth be told, there are many of us who haven't. There are some things that have happened in our lives that we so deeply regret, and those regrets, it's like a bag, it's a weight that we carry that just keeps us from experiencing the bigger, better, newer that God has for us. And so we're going to talk for the next few moments. What do we do with those? How do, we, how do we live beyond? How do we move beyond our regrets? And there are three ways that I believe God helps us with it. There are many, but three we're going to look at just for a couple of moments. And, and if you're following along on your phone and the notes you can or online, all of our family and friends online, you can print out and follow along. And here's the first one. Living beyond our regrets begins with reviewing them. I want you to write or think reviewing. I want you to review. It, it may seem counterintuitive. I, I want to live beyond them. But, but you will never live beyond them if you don't review them. I didn't say relive them. I didn't say replay them. I didn't say rehash them. But they need to be reviewed. And here's, here's why. Regrets provide us with essential feedback. Regrets are feedback. Emotional, mental. They're, they're feedback. If we'll listen to our regrets but not live in them, they can motivate changes. Regrets that we listen to and get feedback from can motivate growth. If you've ever felt bad about a regret and, and now you're living differently, that helped you to grow. So, so regrets that are listened to, the feedback from regrets can help us. Now, one of the things the Bible helps us with when it comes to reviewing regrets is to again understand they're not all the same. And the Bible gives us what I believe are three of the, the basic categories of regrets. And I'm going to walk you through them for just a moment. Here's the first. There are regrets of actions. Regret of action. The Bible's full of examples of regret of action. So is your life and mine. All right, quick one. How many of you have ever said something, and the moment you said it, you wish you hadn't said it? Yeah, some, some of you are amazing. You, you are so controlled. 
Let me try it for the rest of you who are truthful. How many of you have ever texted something, and the moment you texted it, you went, oh, oh no, I have good news for you. Apple's come out with an update. You can now delete texts. Now, you only have two minutes, but when you send that text off and you went wrong, right message, wrong person, you got two minutes, and you can erase that baby. It's, let me tell you, this feature is going to be used a lot by me, okay? Come on, how many of you have ever sent something out, oops, ever said something, oops? Those are, those are regrets of action, something we did. The same thing can be said of, of decisions we make that bite us or cost us big time. Bible's full of them. Many times it shows us what, what, what happens by certain decisions and consequences. David had, David had the, the regret of committing adultery and then murder to hide his adultery, and it impacted him and his family for the rest of their lives. Um, Peter had a lot of regrets, but without a doubt, the biggest one was when he said to Jesus, if all the other disciples run from you, I'll be there. I'll never deny you. I'll die for you. Yeah, he meant it, but he couldn't pull it off. He couldn't do it. And when the pressure was on, he ran like everyone else and went beyond everyone else. And the three times he denied, I even know who he is, and he cursed his name. And what's so interesting, the Bible tells us that the third time that he denied Jesus, he was close enough to see Jesus. He could see what was going on. And the third time that he said, I don't know the man, and he cursed his name, and a rooster crowed, and he looked up, and Jesus was looking right at him. How many think that look might haunt you for the rest of your life? I just said, I don't know you, and then I look right into your eyes. And the Bible says that Peter went out into a field and he wept bitterly. The, the word just means he just, he just lost it. That's, that's a regret of action. The Apostle Paul had action regrets. He, he tried to persecute the church. He imprisoned some people. He killed other people because he knew what it was. He had regrets of things he did that later on he wished he had not done, but they were actions that he did. There's a Samaritan woman that Jesus visits in John chapter 4. He goes to a Samaritan village, and there's a, a woman by a well at noon, and that's not when you would go the hottest time of day to draw water. She was there alone. She wanted to be alone. You know the story. She meets with Jesus. And she had some regrets, five of them, called marriages. She was married five times. And every one of those marriages represent pain. For all of you in the room who know or know of someone who's been through a divorce, divorce in many ways, it is a death of a marriage. But it's worse than death because there's no body to bury. Because you still have to deal with a live person and, 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 and the repercussions of that. It's incredible. It's it's. it's, it's Rejection, it's loss, it's failure on multiple levels. There are a few regrets as painful as the regrets of a broken relationship and a broken marriage and a broken family. And this woman had been broken at least five times. Her heart, her life, her relationships, there's, there's so much more to that story than we even know. I'm just telling you those were all five marriages or five decisions and five regrets of actions. And we all have them. Sometimes we... Immediately, no, I should not have done that. Sometimes we figure it out later, I should not have done that. But that's one type of regret, the regret of an action that we did. Here's a second. Secondly, there are regrets of inaction. James 4, verse 17. James writes, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then what? Not do it. Hold it. The sin of action, biblically speaking, is called the sin of commission. You do something. You commit something. But biblically speaking, there is a sin of omission. The sin of omission and sin, again, don't think in terms of rebellion as much as sin is missing the mark. It's missing the plan. It's missing the goal. It's missing God's best. I can miss God's best by doing things I shouldn't, and I can miss God's best by do, not doing things I should do. It's the word I didn't say. It's the deed I didn't do. It's the call to obedience that I didn't follow. And what's really interesting is that, that these things in surveys of regrets, these things that we didn't do that we should have done are often the biggest regret that we have. There was a, a really interesting survey, and, and over the last several, actually, months, but especially weeks, 
I've been reading through multiple studies and research on regrets. It's an amazing, amazing field of study because everybody has them. And, and in a study of people, and they ask them, write down your, your biggest regret. And let me just show you a few of the regrets this, this test group wrote down. Burning bridges, never speaking up, not being a good husband, should have spent more time with family, staying in my comfort zone, not saying I love you, never applying to med school, not making the most of every day, not being a better friend. Now, one of the things about this list, and the reason I wanted you to see it, I want to give it to you, was as I went through this list, the one common denominator other than the regret is most of them started with the word not. I regret not doing something. I regret not saying something. I regret not pursuing a dream. I regret not going to medical school. Again, as those who research regrets, and there are two social psychologists and researchers, Tom Gilovich, Vicky Medvek, and they study regrets, and here's one of the things that they have found, that people tend to regret their actions in the short term, but their inactions in the long term. That when people look back at their life, the thing they regret most is not what they did, it's what they didn't do. In fact, statistically, 84% regret more what they didn't do to 16% of what they did. I wish I had said this. I wish I had done that. A poet put it this way. For all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. It might have been are some of the saddest words we can speak because they are regrets of inaction, of missing moments. Now, here's the third. Thirdly, there are regrets of others' actions or other people's inactions. What I mean is some of our regrets, it wasn't something we did or didn't do. It was someone who didn't say something to me or do something in my life or or give what was needed in my life. Failed to say something or said something they should not have said. There are so many in this room. Again, if we had the time, and we don't. But some of you had things said to you when you were a child, five, six, seven, eight years of age, and you still remember it. You were called a name at school. You were called a name in your family. You had somebody pick on something about you. And you're now, it's... 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 years later, and you can still quote it. You didn't do it. You didn't say it. It's a regret from what someone else did or did not do. And and it's so important, the abuse, neglect, rejection, betrayal, mistreatment, abandonment. I know they're painful, but it's still important to review them. Because they offer us essential feedback into ourselves, into others. And most importantly, they offer us essential feedback into God. Here's what I mean. Sin has been described as the attempt to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. Sin is missing the target. It's missing the mark. It's missing God's best way for the best life. And when you and I sin, it's not that the desire was necessarily wrong, but that way we fulfilled it was. Or we allow the desire to take us in a bad direction. I think the same thing can be said of regrets, honestly. As I review regrets in my life, review regrets in your life, many times the things we regret were legitimate. We wanted them, we needed them, but we went after them in wrong places. We tried to find them in wrong people. We tried to find them in in medicating ourselves in a variety of ways. And, and, And all, listen, at the bottom of our regrets, my opinion, is regrets are spiritual hunger. Regrets are a hunger for God. We have a hunger for more, but where's the more found? It's found in God. And so by reviewing all the things I chased, I find out the one I need to chase is God. Because the only one who can fill my life so full that I don't regret is God. So so regrets, regrets are so important for us to review. That's the first way that you and I live beyond them. Now here's the second. Living beyond our regrets secondly requires repenting over them. 
Now, again, I'm aware repenting is not a word we use a lot. It's not used very much, except maybe in church. And, and again, many of our terms we need to define. Repenting comes from a, a compound Greek word. Repent is metanoia. Metanoia is, is two words. Noah is the part that has to do with mind or thinking. Meta means to change, to be transformed, as in metamorphosis. So metanoia is, is about change. Metanoia is about repenting. Now listen, repenting is far more about a turning point than a feeling point. Now the reason I say that is many of us kind of equate repenting with an emotion. I feel bad. Okay, you feel bad. I feel bad. I feel bad because I did bad. Okay, that, that's fine. But that's not repenting. That's feeling bad. Repenting is always a change. It's a change. It's a turning. It's a turning point. So repenting is not an emotion. Repenting is motion. Repenting is I'm hurting because I'm going this way, and I'm going to repent. I'm going to go this way. Come on. How many of you ever had someone say to you, I'm sorry, and they meant it, but they never change? And then they tell you, they say, I'm still sorry, and you are still sorry. But sorry and repentance aren't the same thing. Feel bad, that's fine. Feeling bad can, can motivate us, but that is not what I'm talking about. That's not what repenting is. Repenting is a change of mind. It's a change of heart. It's a change of direction. It is literally turning. It is a turning point. And if you and I are ever going to live beyond our regrets, there must be a turning point in our regrets. A turning point is how we view and deal with our regrets. All right, let me, let me try to help you with this. Uh, again, how many of you have a smartphone? Anybody have a smartphone? Okay, now let me, let me explain this in smart form terms. When it comes to our regrets, we need a reset. Now, if you've got a smartphone, like I have a smartphone, sometimes they get messed up. Stuff happens to them. So you take them to the Apple store, and you go to what's called the Genius Bar. Yeah, there's a real place called the Genius Bar. Now, between you and me, they don't look like geniuses, but that's what they call themselves. They're geniuses at the Genius Bar. Some of you may be a genius, and God bless you. So anyway, they're geniuses. And you got a separate appointment to see a genius. And so you set up an appointment, and, and you take them your phone. Now, your phone's messed up. Your phone is causing you some regrets, okay? Like that some things aren't happening right. The first thing they will do is what they call a soft reset. Now, a soft reset is basically shutting your phone down and turning it back on. Now, I am not an IT guy. I don't want to be an IT guy. Uh, I like IT people to a certain degree. So anyway, so, so IT people, like we have a guy that, that's, that's our, T, our IT guy for our church and, and he does a great job. But most of the time when something isn't working in my computer or phone and I'll call him, do you know what he tells me to do? Turn it off. Turn it off, turn it on. So I have learned many times, like my wife, I will fix her phone and because uh, I'm brilliant, no, I just turn it off. I turn it off, I turn it on, it cleans some things up, it cleans some cachets, it cleans some various things. Now, I have two ways of fixing things. I turn it on and turn it off, or I use what's called impact maintenance. I mean, you hit it, right? Like sometimes it's a bad connection. Keep a rubber hammer close, right? Like hit something. And if it's a bad connection, maybe it'll knock it back together. And even if it doesn't, you feel better because you hit something. So I'm just saying, so, so impact maintenance, and a soft reset. It can be a way of, of, of getting a, a phone that's kind of having problems straightened out. But it doesn't always work. Sometimes you turn it off and on and off and on and, and it doesn't get better. Because if, if the problems are deeper and more significant, a soft reset won't do it, which is why your phone and the geniuses at the Genius Bar will then use what's called a factory reset. Now, your phone has this. Be careful with it because the factory reset is really interesting. Stay with me. The factory reset will take your phone back to the manufacturer's original settings. Now, to do that, it has got to eliminate all the current settings, all the applications, all the data. Everything. When you do a factory reset on your phone, it is wiped clean. It is erased. When you do a factory reset, your phone is what it was like for the few moments it was first assembled in the factory. 
before it was ever, anything ever happened to it. It's like new again. It didn't stay in the factory long because they're shipping them out. But for a little while in the factory, it was new. And, and when you have a factory reset on your phone, it's new. Now, I'm not saying on the outside. It still has the chips and bumps and things you've done to it. But the inside, all those applications, all those, all those things, all, those, all the data, it's all erased. On the inside, it's brand new. Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a what? New person. The past is what? Forgotten. And everything is what? All right. Just because this is so important, we're going to read it one more time out loud together. Okay. That's all of us. All right. Because like three of you helped me. <clears throat> now you all help me. Here we go. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The past is forgotten and everything is new. Repenting is our factory reset. When you and I have a change of mind, of heart, of direction, when I turn from my way to God's way, I have a fa- I'm not just like new, I am brand new. You are as new as the creator when he made you. You are as clean, you are as wiped, you are as, you are as pure. You are made new I am new in God's. Now, that doesn't mean on the outside there's not still some bumps and scrapes. And Yeah, and one day you're going to have a new outside. That's another good chapter coming. One day the Bible says you're going to have a new body. How many can't wait for that one? You're going to trade. Talk about upgrades. You're going to trade in an earthly body for an eternal body, a temporary body that can be diseased for a body that is perfect forever. That's what you got coming. That's the upgrade God promises. But before your body gets upgraded, your insides, your spirits, your mind, really the real you, can become absolutely brand new. To be brand new doesn't mean we can't recall what's happened, but listen to me. What's happened in our past no longer controls us. See, for some of us, our past is controlling us, it's dominating us, it's debilitating us. Repenting changes. It changes the orientation of our life. It changes the settings of our life. In Jesus, we're not like new, we are new. It resets us with God. It resets us with others. It resets us with the purposes and plans of God. Now, let me get real with you. God wants to reset your relationships. It also takes others, but God will work on them too. Paul says, live at peace, at order with everyone as far as it depends on you, which means I can't make peace with you if you don't want peace with me, but God will work in your heart to make peace with me. How many of you have prayed for somebody that didn't want, and, and in fact, you're sitting by them, and you never would have thought they'd sit by you in church. Don't point at them, but they're here because you prayed for them. Because God can work on resisting hearts, ours and others. Paul writes this about repenting and, and resetting, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For the kind of sorrow, the repenting, the regret God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. That's a direction. It doesn't make us feel a certain way. It changes the orientation, the direction of our life. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow, for repenting and resetting. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, see, it, it, it feels bad, but it doesn't change anything, results in spiritual death. In other words, if I don't have a repenting, if I don't have a change, if I don't have a change in how I view me, how I view others, how I view what happened to me, how I view God and what God has for me, if I don't have a repenting, a change, a turning point, I'll experience death. Death is nothing but being cut off. It's separation from the life, the story I was meant to live. So the first key to moving beyond regrets that debilitate us and weigh us down is i got to review them, understand what they are, how they are. Then I need to repent. I need to, I need to have a turning point of how I think, how I act, a, re, a, a resetting of my whole inner life by God. I'm made new in God again, brand new in God. And then there's one more. The third is this. Living beyond our regrets involves redeeming them. Another word that we don't use a lot. And and again, at times I apologize for using biblical words, but these are powerful words we need to understand. 
Now, some of you in finance will use the word redeem. You redeem a stock, you redeem something, you buy it back, you trade what it is for what you want it to be, the, the, the stock to the money, to the cash. To redeem means to leverage, to leverage our regrets for the bigger, better story and purposes God has for us. That's how we move beyond our regrets. That's how we live beyond them. Uh, let me give you some tangible examples. We leverage or redeem our mistakes that cost us big time when we help someone else who made that mistake recover from their mistake. We redeem our battle with addiction by helping someone else win their battle with addiction. And I redeem my regret when, when I've learned from my regret, I've changed because of my regret, and now I help someone else learn and change because of their regret. Now I redeem that regret. I give that regret a new meaning and a new purpose, and it becomes part of the new chapter of my life. We live beyond the regret of our divorce or our heartbreaking loss or our devastating setback when we help someone else with their divorce, their heartbreaking loss, their devastating setback. Now, to help you with this, Oscar Stevenson is one of our Celebrate Recovery leaders and he's redeeming, and he's living beyond his regrets. And I want you to welcome him, because he's going to come share his story with us. Would you welcome Oscar? Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to say, Pastor, I do agree with everything that you're passing on down through here. Um, in my past, I have many regrets. For one, I mean, as a young kid, I was put up for adoption. Right then and there, as a young kid and being passed off to somebody else, something that I had no control over, had to make me feel a little bit kind of bad in that position. But that is one of those regrets that was caused by others. Also, later on in that years of being in that position where I was adopted and everything, I had to make a choice between my biological mother and my adopted mother. Now at 12 years old, I get choked up mostly every time I think about this. At 12 years old, no one, no child at 12 years old needs to be in a position where they need to choose one parent over another. Somehow, some way, I found that the choices that I made was going to hurt someone. And as I watched my biological mother walk outside that door, crying after a choice I made at 12 years old, was a regret that stuck with me for a long time. Even up into my adult years, I joined the military and made the choice of using alcohol substances. Now, the alcohol substances there led me to have, make choices into ruining two marriages in my life. The choices of using alcohol substances earned me one DUI. And it also earned me some time sitting in the jail cell. Now, while I was sitting there in that jail cell, believe me, so many regrets just ran through my mind, and I just had to say to myself, this is not how I'm supposed to live. Now, yes, I was mandated to go to some substance abuse classes. No choice of my own, but I had to go to them. But my real change came from when I went home after coming out of that cell and I was given an intervention. To sit there and look at my family, look at my children, some friends, just come and tell me their thoughts about what, I, what they thought about me and my behaviors, that was a crushing blow to my self-esteem and to my integrity. I knew then I had to change. So there was a choice that I did make. I chose to go to celebrate recovery. Right then and there is where I saw a bunch of people who were struggling with the same issues that I had, but they were finding hope and healing in Jesus Christ. As I was going through my substance abuse classes, it started to turn interesting to me that there is hope in sobriety. Oh, believe me, the regrets that I have were just a chapter in my life, but it wasn't my whole story. It wasn't my whole story. Today, I'm a substance abuse counselor. I'm helping others that are out there struggling with their... <laughs> they were, they're struggling with their substance abuses. And I'm over there making a difference, 
helping them to see that there is hope in sobriety. I'm also a co-lead right here at Bonita Valley Community Church Celebrate Recovery. The same program that helped me, I'm in a position now to help others, to find a relationship with Jesus Christ and to also become just what they're meant to be in Christ. Jesus is redeem redeeming me today, Pastor. He is really redeeming me today. And I'm so glad to be in the position that I'm in. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Thank you Oscar. One of the things I love about Oscar's story, and Oscar being willing to share it, and some of you need to hear this, some of your biggest regrets are going to become opportunities for some of your greatest life-changing ministry. The things God brought you through, he's going to use you to help bring others through. And many times, why did this happen to me? Why did others do this to me? Why did I do this to myself? Why did I allow this to happen? And, and there's all kinds that we talk about. We need to review our choices, others' choices, how it happened. But the ultimate deal is God can buy it back. He can redeem it. What others meant for evil, what Satan meant for evil, God means for good. And he can make that very place of our greatest wound become a source of our greatest influence and help for others. One of my favorite quotes that the Oscar story reminds me of is a C.S. Lewis quote, and C.S. Lewis says this. I'll put it on the screen. He says, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. Oscar can't go back and change the decision of his birth mother and then his adopted mother. He can't change those decisions. Or even the decision he made at 12, and what, a, what an incredibly difficult choice to put on a 12-year-old, and the other choices of his life. But the deal is, you can't change how it started, but you can change how it finishes. You can make a choice, that because your chapter is a chapter, but it's not your whole story. And one of the ways that you move beyond the regrets of your life, and we all have them, and some of you, they are incredibly deep. Some of you, again, as I mentioned earlier, you have a sack of regrets. And you carry them every day of your life. They weigh you. They weigh your dreams, your hopes. And God today wants you to understand something, that he can, he can set you free and use you. One of the ways that you get free is by setting others free. And now you go, you know what, that wasn't meaningless and that wasn't purposeless because God redeems everything, including my regrets. So please hear me. Chapters are not the whole story unless we allow them to be. There's not a person here without regret chapters, but they don't have to be your last chapter. How do we live beyond our regrets? How do we move into a new year and new chapters? God helps us three ways. The first way I live beyond my regrets is by reviewing them. I don't know, it seems counterintuitive. I want to forget them. No, no, you can't really move past them until you face them. And we stop and say, what kind of regret is this? And sometimes they're action regrets. Sometimes they're inaction regrets. Now, I'm not going to whole nother message, but, but for me, and I, I was praying through this and working through this in just my own life, uh, I have I had a habit. My mom and dad are both now in, in heaven with, with, with the Lord, but when, when they were on earth, I would call my parents every Saturday. They live in Michigan, and so I would call them every Saturday, and, and often my dad would answer the phone and say, here's your mom. <laughs> I mean, you know what that's like. <laughs> like, dads are good about handing the phone to someone else. And, and my mom... Again, she's in heaven, so if she's mad at me, she, she can't sin there. But um, my mom, it was easy to talk to my mom because you didn't have to talk. She just carried the whole conversation. She did her part and your part. So my mom was easy to talk to. And so I, my mom would, would talk and, and go on. And, and I would call every Saturday. And then it was a Saturday that she, that she died, and they were coming back from a family reunion. And, and, and I normally called on Saturday, but I didn't call on that Saturday because I, I, I know they're traveling. I could have called because they have phones, and they could have talked. But, but I thought, oh, they're traveling, and I'll just wait and then she went into a coma on that Saturday and never woke up. 
Now, again, that's a regret. I, no, listen, I, I talk to my mom a lot, but it's like I, I still should have called. I, I didn't make that mistake with my dad. After her death, I called him every single Saturday, no matter what, no matter where, no matter where I was, when it was. I called him on Sundays. He would watch the webcast, and I'd call and say, did you go to church today? And he'd, yep. And so we would talk, and so I called him every Saturday, every Sunday, no matter where I was, because that was a regret I didn't want to have with my dad. It wasn't a make or break deal, but I, I wanted to make sure, and I've told you previously as a pastor, I'll get called, someone is dying, and, or they're sick, and can you see them? And, and I'll, I'll be there in a couple of days. By the time I got there, they had passed away. So when I get those calls, I go right away if I at all can, because I don't want those regrets. So there are action regrets and inaction regrets, and i got to review them. And, and, and by reviewing them, they motivate me. They fuel me. I don't want to feel that. I don't want to be like I don't want that again. And so review your regrets, your action, your inaction, what you should have said, what you should have done. Review what others did to you and understand that that wasn't God. God didn't do that to you. But God can use what others do to you. It moves us to the second way we, 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 we move and live beyond our regrets is by repenting. Repenting is, is not a feeling point, it's a turning point. And I've got to have a reset of my mind and a reset of my spirit and a reset of relationships. And so I need a reset. God, give me a reset. I don't want to feel something. That's fine. I want to change. I want to turn. And so God helps us to reset. He makes you brand new on the inside, and one day you'll be brand new on the outside. You'll have the biggest, best upgrade of your life that will go on for your eternal life. It, it, won't, it can't get any better than that. There's more to your story. But that repenting, that reset, some of us need today. God, I need a new mind. I need a new way to think. I need a new perspective. I need to make new choices because I see things differently. I'm glad that you feel bad and I feel bad when we do something bad, but feeling bad won't change your life. Repenting will change. And how do you, God gives us the power to change, the power to turn, the power to go a new direction, which leads to the third way that we live beyond our regrets, and that's by redeeming them. We buy them back. It's like, I want nothing to do with it. No, 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 no. Some of the biggest best, most powerful things you'll ever do with your life will often come out of the things you regretted. And God takes that bad thing and makes it one of the most powerful ways you help, you influence, you change other people's lives. By being the example of what God did in your life, in their life, so they have hope that they can see that their life, that their regrets are not the final chapter in their life. And that's the story of how you and I live beyond our regrets and experience a new year and a new chapter and the more God has for us. Would you bow your heads just for a moment? Close your eyes just, just for a moment. And I ask you to close your eyes not because, again, it's, it's a more spiritual thing to do. It's just the eyes I want you to see with aren't in your head. They're in your heart. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened, that you might see 2020 with your heart eyes. And online, wherever you are, whatever time it may be, listen very carefully. I want to pray with you and for you. I want to pray that the regrets that keep you from the biggest, best chapters of your life, God will help you to live beyond them. It begins, first of all, with accepting Jesus as the Savior and leader of your life. And right where you sit or right where you are right now, you can pray a simple surrendering prayer with me. And it's as simple as this. Jesus, forgive me. I repent. I want to change the direction of my life and thinking. Thank you for dying on the cross. You paid for my sins. And when you rose again, you gave me the power to be brand new. I accept you as my, my Savior and my leader. And I will follow you with my whole heart, mind, and body. And his word says to as many as receive him, he gives you the power, the ability to be. Now, Father, I pray one more prayer for those who are so weighed down by their life-crushing regrets. I pray for that one who was sexually abused. 
I pray for that one who is not protected by the ones who should have been protecting them. I pray for that one who's been through a divorce. It was not their choice. I pray for that one, Lord, who went through some incredibly damaging experiences that was not, not their plan. I pray for parents whose hearts are broken. I pray for children whose hearts are broken. And I thank you that your word says you are near to the brokenhearted. I pray for healing. I pray for hope. I pray for new chapters. I pray, Lord, that we would turn the page. And I thank you for a new year, and I thank you for more than we've ever dreamed, thought, hoped, or imagined. In Jesus' name.